All right, so as I was saying, this is a different class than the simultaneous course because this is a new technique. It's not simultaneous, it's actually consecutive. And what that means is that the technique is completely different. And, um, and basically, all you have to do is learn a new material that, or a new technique and continue learning your um, criminal uh, terminology. You will see that in the class manual for this, um, for this course, you have criminal terminology to study on your own. And then in class, um, I'm teaching a technique, a new technique. The good news about this class is that uh, there is no final exam, like one-on-one -on -one final exam, as you had with me, many of you, in, uh, for the simultaneous course. That one-on-one -on -one final exam is not going to be uh, included in this course, simply because there is not going to be a lot of practice here. We're going to spend all four weeks learning a technique, a technique that it is critical in terms of passing the exam. That's, that's how critical it is. It's very, very important technique. Many people actually have difficulties with this technique called consecutive. So what you will have to do on your end, although there is laboratory here in this class, and you can attend those labs, absolutely, um, but what you will really have to concentrate on is in perhaps reviewing the video from the week. That we, like, for example, today we have lecture one, during this week, review that because most of the explanations that I'm going to give you regarding the technique is actually on video. It's, there's no, no practice, no audio for this. So you, on your end, all you will do is you will study your criminal terminology that you have in your class manual that you can download. You know, there is already for lecture one some criminal terminology and then for lecture two, I will discuss some of those terms, of course. And uh, <clears throat> the whole idea is that, uh, that you learn a technique more than anything else. I don't, if, you, if you ask me what was the, um, the, uh, the main goal of our previous course, is for you to be able to interpret arraignment and to learn your criminal terminology. What's the main goal for this course? It's for you to learn the consecutive mode of interpretation, the technique that I'm going to discuss here in class, and the criminal terminology. You, you have to continue learning um, criminal terminology. And those are new terms, of course, new criminal terms. Because you remember from in the previous course, I don't know and up to what letter we cover. I don't know if it was letter C or D or whatever the case is, but now there is a continuation of those terms. See, the, the point is that you need to learn all those legal terms by the end of this course. So when you move on to the next course, which is interpreting uh, in superior court misdemeanors, you're going to need all those terms. So you do have to find a way to study them and know them well. So if you feel that you have doubts in regards to the terminology from the previous course, this is a good time. In this course, it's a good time to actually spend some time going over it because there is really no practice that I'm going to be assigning. You're more than welcome to access the lab and do some of the practices there but I'm not going to assign any particular practice in the consecutive. It takes a lot of time to develop this technique that we're going to develop here. So uh, this means that there is no reason for us to have a one-on-one -on -one final examination because there's no practice. But you will have a written exam, and the written exam will be based on lectures one, two, three, and four for this course as well as lectures one, two, three, and four from the previous course. So the written exam is more demanding uh, than what you had last uh, for the last course. But it's usually much easier to complete simply because there is no pressure of being, you know, someone being uh, monitoring and, and so on and so forth. Uh, we have to make a decision uh, as to whether we're going to have class the Wednesday that uh, is right before Thanksgiving, uh, I believe it's the 23rd, uh, whether we're going to have class or we are not going to have class. Um, we have to make that decision. Uh, we can all think about it if you want to. I think it would probably be a good idea to take that day off because many people get ready for Thanksgiving and we do have plenty of time, particularly because you don't have the final examination one-on-one. -on -one. So it's very possible that that lecture, which will fall under lecture number uh, three, 
Um, that lecture, I believe it's number three, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, let's see, today is the 10th, 17th, yeah, uh, or the 9th, what is, today is the 9th actually, so the 16th will be lecture 2, and the 23rd will be lecture 3. That lecture, we probably won't have any class on that day, on the 23rd. Uh, I will confirm next week, and that will, that means that we're going to finish one week uh, later, and we still have time, because we're going to finish by December 8, 9, or 10 or so. But again, if there is any opposition uh, to um, us canceling that class, is just for the sake of the uh, fact that the uh, that we have Thanksgiving the next day, then let me know. But I usually we take uh, we do take uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday uh, when it's Thanksgiving. It's the longest uh, break that we take. Um, the li live hours with the instructor are still Mondays and Saturdays, <clears throat> and uh, and uh, the same times we may be adding some more times or doing some minor changes, but that's going to happen for the next year, not now. So you feel free to access, but you will find that you don't need to access necessarily the live hours that often anymore with the instructor. And that's because because there is no practice in this class. We're not gonna, you know, we're not gonna do a practice in class. We're gonna do practices, but it's gonna be practices in terms of learning the technique, but not an official consecutive practice. Um, uh, okay, if it doesn't interfere with it, yeah, yeah, I think so. I agree. No, it doesn't interfere with the time. We're fine. This is a really fun class. Most people, so you know, you don't, you shouldn't feel pressure on this one. Most people pass with flying colors. Everybody gets an A generally. Uh, it's fun, and what you're gonna learn here in this next three, four, in this next four weeks, or maybe five, if we take that day off, um, it's something that you won't learn anywhere else. It's just a technique that was developed that I actually teach for the federal courts. That's how powerful it is. Um, I mean, I teach it all over the country uh, and sometimes even outside the country because this technique is my technique and it's kind of copyrighted to me, but you can use it obviously. And uh, and it is an amazing technique. So um, it, it's really a fun class. But what I would ask you please to do is to make sure that you study your terminology and also review the terminology from the previous course. Because otherwise, you're going to pay a price when we um, when when you take the next course, which is the interpreting superior courts misdemeanor course. <clears throat> so that's kind of the presentation of this uh, particular course, and that's where we are going to go. Now, in terms of how we're going to do this, um, the class is going to be the, pretty much the same. We're going to uh, I'm going to start at six o'clock until around seven forty. We take our 25 minute break and then we do the last portion of the class until about five to nine or so. Okay, so that's, uh, there's no difference there. Uh, my email remains the same, wagnerinterpreting.com. You can also send me questions directly from your site, from the site that you access, uh, that you just access to watch this video or this uh, live session. And, um, and my suggestion, instead of doing a lot of lab work, my suggestion is for you to always go back to the lecture that, 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 that just happened. Like, for example, during this week, you go back to this lecture. You don't watch the whole lecture, but you start watching from the portion where I start the, take the teaching the technique. Okay. Now, we did say that this is a different technique. And the question, of course, is, so wait a minute now. We have two, two techniques, simultaneous and consecutive. Which one should I use in court? Okay, so that's a very logical question. Which, which one should you use? Well, it is, it, this is a very tricky question, uh, honestly, because things have changed with, the, um, with what we call VRI, which is Video Remote Interpreting. Or oh, incidentally, um, the entity that is um, hiring interpreters for immigration court have already asked me to get as many as possible, but you're not ready for it, unfortunately, because you haven't, you haven't developed the legal terminology and the necessary skills. 
Just want to let you know that uh, once you are in the felony course, that is going to be kind of somewhere in early March, I will make an announcement again and you will be able to uh, apply for it. You need to have a one-year experience in the judiciary system. That experience can really be anything that applies. See, they, it's, a, it's, it's a requirement from the government. It's a really silly requirement. Um, it, it just doesn't make much sense, but it's a requirement from the government and all you have to show is that you have some experience in the judiciary world. I mean, maybe interpreting occasionally, it doesn't have to be necessarily interpreting. We do have some volunteering for, uh, I believe that Nicole sent uh, a mass email for those who would like to participate in the Immigration Speranza project. And uh, she sent it to, I guess, everybody or maybe to a few classes. But uh, if not, I'll ask her to send it to everybody again. Uh, and if you are, if you want to start, you know, um, taking your career towards immigration while you wait until you pass the exam to become a course certified interpreter, then you should really start participating in that, uh, in those, uh, in the uh, immigration uh, program. Um, that's actually called the Esperanza Project. And I think they have a session and orientation this coming Friday. But that will actually, if you do that, that qualifies as one year experience in the judiciary system. And that's actually pretty good. Now, you probably won't have one year by March, but you can add a few other things here and there. Be creative. I'm not telling you to lie in your resume. I'm just telling you to be creative. And I am telling you that in general, based on what students tell me, there is no verification necessarily of that one year experience. Okay, so, you, you know, it, it's kind of a requirement that ha it has to be complied with. <coughs> but actually, um, it, it's just a kind of a silly requirement. You can have one year judiciary experience, but if you don't know how to interpret, what good does it do? Right, so... So in coming back now to the techniques, um, okay, so we, I, if you haven't received, yes, workers' compensation firm do qualify. Uh, if you work in workers' compensation, the way it qualifies is if you write on your resume something like this, work as an interpreter in the workers' compensation field, although you may be interpreted one time in one year, it doesn't matter, from this date up to the present. Uh, some of the duties included interpreted for, um, um, what do you call it, for um, claimants. Uh, and um, if you did go to court and help the attorney interpret, then you can say, and also went to the appeals board, that's where workers' compensation appeals board, to interpret for attorneys and clients, and that would be perfectly fine. Uh, I will make sure that uh, Nicole sends that tomorrow to everybody, okay, so that you can actually participate. But you have to, you're in, in week number, I mean, course number two, we started with a lot of people. Some of them didn't pass last course, unfortunately. Many of you passed with an A, and some of, people, some of them actually didn't actually take the exam, about two or three students. So we start getting smaller groups. And it is now the time for you to start thinking about how you're going to uh, pro uh, uh, plan your, your, your interpreting career. And the best thing you can do is begin with immigration that doesn't require certification as soon as possible. And, but you need to have the knowledge because see, if, I, if you do that now, if you apply now to the immigration court for the immigration courts, what will happen is that you will fail your, your exam because you're not ready for it. You need to have more simultaneous, particularly, as well as consecutive. And that's something that you develop in the next two courses. And that's why there, there is that waiting period. The problem is that if you, if you apply now and you take, go through the program and you don't pass, you need to wait one year. So you have to be sure. I mean, as your instructor, I have to give you this op opportunity, but you have to be ready for it. There is nothing better you can do now than studying the, the legal terms, because if you don't know your legal terms, no matter what class you're in, you're going to fail that exam. OK, so you have plenty of time, your turn, so to speak, to apply with the 
company that is hiring will be sometime in March. But the best thing you can do is know your legal terms and, and practice in the next course particularly. So having said that, the question is, what about the simultaneous and consecutive? When do you use one? When do you use the other one? Um, traditionally, traditionally, the consecutive is only used for testimony, which means that if you're interpreting for a witness who speaks Spanish, you will use the consecutive mode. Now, what is the consecutive mode? Well, the witness who speaks Spanish takes the stand and an attorney asks questions. So the, the questions are in English. And the, the interpreter hears the question, waits for the whole question. It's not like simultaneous at the same time. Waits for the whole question. And after the whole question is asked, then the uh, interpreter transfers that into the opposite language. Then the person who speaks Spanish answers that question, and after the whole answer is provided, then the interpreter transfers that into English. So it's basically a back and forth, and the questions are interpreted from English into Spanish, and the answers from Spanish into English. The challenge of this technique is that you don't know how long the person who's answering the question will uh, speak uh, for could basically speak maybe for half a minute, maybe gives you a very long answer, and there is a protocol as to how to control the length of those segments, but there is also a technique that you need to develop, and that's why you're in this class. Simultaneous interpretation traditionally has been used for uh, when you interpret for a defendant who is being charged with a crime and the defendant is just basically listening to what is happening in his case in the courtroom, on the record. And that means that the attorney may be talking to the judge. Maybe there is a, a witness testifying in English, such as police, as a police officer. All that interaction, when the actual person who speaks Spanish that you're interpreting for is not testifying, but is actually sitting down, the defendant is sitting down and listening to what's happening, that has to be interpreted by the interpreter using the simultaneous mode, which is like the arraignments. You could see that in the arraignment, we use the simultaneous mode simply because the uh, person who speaks Spanish was not a witness, was basically a defendant entering a plea and hearing what happened with, you know, what the bail amount is and so on and so forth. So simultaneous is for that purpose, whereas consecutive is specifically for uh, witness testimony, okay? Now, that's traditionally how these two techniques uh, have been used. Uh, unfortunately, with the implementation of video remote interpreting, there are some platforms, mm, some web platforms, such as WebEx by Cisco, which is actually the one used by the government, for some reason they picked that, and it is used also in immigration, where you cannot interpret simultaneous using that platform, simply because, uh, number one, the, the platform doesn't have that feature. And if you interpret at the same time, it, it just creates a lot of confusion in the courtroom. So when you are doing what we call uh, video remote interpreting, you may be interpreting from home what is happening in a courtroom and the judge may be in the courtroom, you may be in, the, in your home, the, the respondent is in his or her home, the attorneys are in their office, and this, they're all kind of meeting virtually in cyberspace. And in that type of scenario, the simultaneous technique, whenever you use the WebEx platform, is, is, uh, is not possible. This creates lots of problems for interpreters because when it comes to testimony, you know, questions asked to the person who speaks Spanish and answers provided by that individual, then you don't have major problems. I mean, VRI and on-site interpreting or in-person interpreting is basically the same because you hear the question, then you interpret, then you hear the answer, and then you interpret. And that, that platform, WebEx, is capable of, uh, it allows you to do that. But the problem is when the judge gives what, it, what we call a court decision at the end of the case, 
a court decision is the judge in immigration court, particularly at the end of a hearing um, that deals, it's kind of a trial, it's an immigration trial. The judge is going to make a decision as to whether the person can stay in the country or not and what will be the benefits or relief that they will get and so on and so forth. That is highly technical and usually when you are in person you interpret that using the simultaneous mode. But because WebEx doesn't have that capability, then some immigration judges are asking interpreters, and several of them are asking interpreters to interpret in this technique, consecutive, these decisions, which is extremely difficult. And it is extremely difficult. You know why it will be difficult once we learn the technique here, but it's extremely difficult because we as interpreters can remember the original, in other words, the answer provided by the person who speaks Spanish, using three elements. We use our short-term memory, our note-taking, and our visualization memory. In other words, if I tell you something, you can visualize, and that allows you to remember it. But you cannot visualize legal concepts, right? So what happens with those situations is that not only you cannot visualize legal concepts, you cannot take notes for those because as soon as you write something down, the next concept comes in and, and you just cannot control. You'll see that the, the problem. So when you're asked, when the interpreter is asked to interpret using the consecutive mode, these legal structures, like in a court decision, the interpreter relies only on one element, which is short-term memory. And the interpreter, the only way that the interpreter can do that is by kind of memorizing and knowing all the structures that are usually used. But we can't really memorize all the structures because judges combine all these words and create sentences, all these legal words and create sentences that uh, are rather com convoluted and difficult to recall. So <clears throat> with the new implementation of VRI using the WebEx platform, now I can tell you that the technique that is used throughout the hearing is consecutive. It's no longer simultaneous because the, the platform is incapable of providing that feature to you. But when you're in a courtroom, yes, indeed, you do use the simultaneous mode when you're interpreting for the defendant who's sitting at the defendant's table and you're interpreting everything that is being said and you only use the consecutive only for the testimony of a witness who's uh, Spanish-speaking witness. Mm -hmm. So it is as, so both modes are used in trials, absolutely. If you are in an actual trial in criminal court, uh, you know, you are the interpreter, right? And you, you're interpreting for the defendant, so most of the times you will only use simultaneous because defendants do not testify generally. But if the attorney determines that the defendant should testify in court and the defendant does take the witness stand, then that is when the consecutive technique comes into play. You can find a situation in court where you really have two interpreters in the same courtroom. And how is that? Well, if you have uh, it, you know, so here, let's say that's the defense table. This is the DA's table. So this is DA, that's a D, and that's the defense table. So here is the attorney for the defendant. Here is the defendant, and here is the interpreter. Here's the DA. Sometimes they have an in, uh, investigative officer. And, of course, you have the judge here. So here's the judge. Here you're going to have the witness stand. Here, or on the actually on this side, you're going to have the jury box. Uh, of course, there is going to be a door here that doesn't allow you to go in there. Uh, most likely, you're going to have right here the bailiff. Therefore, you're going to have the court clerk here. There's going to be a door here that takes to chambers, which is the office, judge's office. And then there is going to be most likely a door here that takes to lockup or the cells. So 
So this is a typical distribution. There are some chairs here usually for attorneys who are waiting sometimes here as well. So <clears throat> if you are in a trial and there are 12 jurors here in the trial, right? Oh, and here is the court reporter, court reporter, okay? Now th this distribution is, there is, a, there is a logic behind this. The logic is that if a witness comes to testify and is going to testify against the defendant, obviously. Some will be testified for the defendant, some against the defendant. So when the witness testifies, that is testified against the defendant, what the, what the, the, the system wants is that witness to be as far as possible from the defendant. So that's why they don't put the defendant on this table, but rather in the fur, further da, uh, back table, right, this one. So when the witness is here testifying against the defendant, then the defendant doesn't have the opportunity of perhaps intimidating the defendant. Furthermore, the rule says that the jury has to be very close to the witness. So that's why the jury is going to be located here, not on this side, because the, the witness has to be far from the defendant and the jury has to be close to the witness. Okay, so keep that in mind. The bailiff has to be close to the defendant. That's why the bailiff is, bailiff is placed here. So there is a reason behind all this. <clears throat> and that is, you know, and there is a, a reason for several, uh, you know, there are, it's just traditionally the way it is, but there is a logic behind it. Uh, of course, the bailiff wants to make sure the defendant doesn't do anything or maybe to protect the defendant because the defendant may belong to a gang. Uh, and then there is another gangs here in the, in the audience portion and then they want to do to harm the defendant. It doesn't happen, but it could happen. And um, so that's kind of the arrangement. So if you are in a trial, here's the defendant, right? Right here, and you are here. So you're interpreting. When you're sitting here, everything is in simultaneous. Okay, always. Mm -hmm. And when the defendant is asked to come and testify, then it will be consecutive because everything from here is consecutive. But you could have a following situation. You could have a defendant who speaks Spanish here, and you are, you are the interpreter, and now you have a witness who speaks Spanish. In fact, this is very common, because if the defendant speaks Spanish, it's very possible that the witnesses, or some of them, will speak Spanish. So you could have here a person who speaks Spanish, and that means that you need a new interpreter. So you have interpreter one here, and then you have interpreter two here. And that interpreter, too, is going to use the consecutive mode. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> what you're going to have is two interpreters in that courtroom, one using the simultaneous to interpret for the defendant and one using the consecutive to interpret for the witness. And this is developed. This is we're going to see what actually how you actually handle that situation when you when you take the uh, course called Interpreting Superior Court Misdemeanors. But what I want you to know is what technique you need to use. Right? So whenever the interpreter is here, it's going to be consecutive. Whenever the interpreter is sitting down next to the defendant, it's going to be simultaneous. Okay? Now, what are the, <coughs> excuse me, the typical challenges of the consecutive? Let me go back in case you want to uh, take a picture of that. Actually, let me just remove myself so uh, I don't ruin the picture. <laughs> so what actually, uh, what are actually the, um, the challenges with the consecutive mode of interpretation? Well, you know that um, um, if I ask you, for example, what is your name? Um, when I say that, that's easy. Anybody can interpret that. It's a short question, so you can remember it. And it's a very manageable vocabulary. What is your name? What is su nombre? Or what is sometimes, let's say the question is, what is your full name? What is su nombre completo? If I ask, if the, if the attorney asks, for example, where were you last night? And that's easy to remember as well. If the, if the question, on the other hand, is 
Please tell us what were you doing the night of December 17, 2022 at approximately 945 at 1735 North Main Street, apartment 167 in Los Angeles, California, 90004. Now that's a much more challenging segment, not only because it's a longer segment, but also, and most important of all, because it had a lot of information that we call factual. Factual information, it happens to be names, addresses, uh, uh, figures in general. Factual information's information is very difficult to visualize. How do you visualize an address unless you live there? How do you visualize a license plate unless it's yours and you're familiar with it? So factual information is in a way Another example of factual information is the legal structures that we discussed earlier, and that's why when you use VRI using the WebEx platform, that's actually when you um, have, that's why you have difficulties um, transferring that, those legal structures because they are very factual. And it is very difficult to transfer factual information, but we're gonna learn techniques for that purpose here. Now, so the challenge could be that the, the question is too long or it could include a lot of factual information or what we like to call information that one cannot visualize, right? Uh, when the answer is provided in Spanish, you're going to face pretty much the same problem, but there is an additional problem to it. And that is that the witnesses tend to provide very long answers. And that's because of a cross-cultural difference. See, in the United States, if somebody is asked a question and the question can easily be, be answered with a yes or no, the expectation is that that person who speaks Spanish or whoever is answering the question will answer with a yes or no. And if he or she answers with a yes or no, that implies that he or she is telling the truth. Because in the U.S., based on the cultural uh, aspect in the United States, if you provide a very long answer, it's like you're trying to hide something. If I ask you, did you have a gun when you went to the party? And then if you say yes, or if you say no, that's kind of a very um, acceptable answer and it implies that you're telling the truth either way. But if you start selling, well, guns, I don't know about guns. In reality, I don't know. I'm, you know, I don't like to have guns, so therefore I don't know. All that type of explanations uh, usually tend to be perceived by the court and by the attorneys as a way of hiding the facts. That's the U.S. In Latin America, it's the opposite. If somebody asks you a question and you answer with a yes or no, you are hiding something. Remember, you are hiding something. So you have to explain. You need to explain. And when you, need, when you need to explain, you are going to provide very long answers, particularly in the court of law. So in Latin America, explaining is an, is an indication that you're telling the truth, whereas answering with a yes or no is an indication that you're hiding something and therefore you're lying. In the U.S., answering with a yes or no, it's an indication that you're telling the truth. And explaining is an indication that you're not telling the truth. So it's, it's very common for people uh, who are testifying in court that the question is, what is your full name? And they will say, me llamo Jose Pérez y le quiero decir que el que está sentado ahí fue el que me quiso matar la noche del mes de enero. Y si ese fue el culpable de todo esto, y juez lo tiene que condenar porque él me quiso matar. It has, not, has nothing to do with the question. Maybe the first part, but the second part has nothing to do with the question. Now, for us interpreters, when you get uh, a character like that, which are, it's just basically a lot of them will answer like that, not, not this is kind of an exaggeration, but in general, there will be some type of, I would say, excessive explanation. When that happens, then you, the interpreter, had to remember that. And the segments become very long. Now, here I have to make a distinction between uh, real, the real job and your state exam. Because 
you don't know this yet, but the state examination, it's not something that is validated by the actual job. What that means is that they may test you on things in the state exam that you will never, ever do in your life. It's unfortunately, and I, I, I say that with kind of sadness here, unfortunately, whoever prepares those exams doesn't test you on the things that we do in court on a daily basis. They follow certain all criteria that is more academic than, uh, than uh, practical. So you're going to see that. That's one of the reasons why you have to take sight translation course. You know, there are two sight translations in the program. That's because the test includes sight translations that are excessively confusing. And you need courses for that because you cannot deliver. That's the test. In real life, that will not happen. Well, when it comes to the consecutive mode, in real life, when you interpret in the courts, in immigration, in criminal court, in civil court. You are, you the interpreter, you must always control the length of the segment. 